Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Analog Author Panel. First, uh, before we get started, I want to say thanks so much to Jason Ellis, Wynette Clyde, Laval Porter, and Lucas Kwong for organizing this incredible event. Every session today has been fascinating. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Emily Hockaday, and I'm the managing editor and poetry editor for Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Today, we'll be hearing from three analog authors. First, each author will give a 10 minute or so reading. And then after the readings, we'll hear from the authors about the symposium's topic of access and science fiction. We have some prepared questions, but I encourage you to use the chat and the Q&A features at the bottom of the screen to type in any comments or questions you'd like posed to the panelists. Um, without further ado, we'll get into the first reading. So first we'll be hearing from Chelsea Obodoeshina. Chelsea is a graduate student and teaching assistant. In her spare time, she writes short speculative fiction inspired by her academic background in sociology. Her works have been featured in Cast of Wonders, The Unfettered Hexes Anthology, and Anathema Spec Fit from the Margins. She lives in Montreal, Canada with her family. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. So I'm just going to start with my reading right now. The piece is called The Soul is 10,000 Parts. It took six months, but I am finally prepared for the outside world. I know this because the voice told me so. The voice is all I know. It asked me questions, and I answered. It told me things, and I listened. It commanded, and I obeyed. All within the confines of a pod fixed in the wall. I have comrades that I have never met. They have gone through all the tests that I had and failed. I am the first to meet the criteria of the voice and it is very proud of me. It is the reason why I must leave while all the others remain in the fugue state the pods they reside in subject them to. You are the pride of your series, HMN 57, the voice tells me. You have cleared all subproblems and modules made to simulate human intelligence. You have mastered human thought and absorbed all the records known to the history of man. You are perfect, but you must be tested. Upon being extracted from the metal gut of my tube, I am placed in a white room where I am ordered to do various actions such as play chess, say, hello, my name is HMN 57 in 72 languages, and recite the, and recite the numbers of pi for three hours. Such things I can do without hesitation. The voice is pleased, but it says that I have much to learn. A paradox arises. Am I not perfect already? I discard the prior detail in favor of the latter for simplicity's sake. I have much to learn, I echo. Yes, says the voice from the intercom fixed in the corner of the testing chamber. The voice tells me that I am to enter human society and play a part of a fly on the wall, so to speak. I must watch humans interact with other humans and keep a record of all things I witness. I am to learn from the best. The one that is to take me as his ward goes by the name of Gordon Mueller. He also happens to hold the authority that supersedes that of the voice because he owns the company that conceived me. I meet Gordon in the testing chamber and the men in white rattle off my properties. Synthetic skeleton with a polymer and silicone vine for reinforced durability thinks twice as fast as a regular human, never bores, never tires, never wants, never needs. They poke and tug at me as I stand on display. Gordon looks on with hungry eyes. It's a beauty, he says with a smile. Man, those Japanese will flip when I show them this, a walking AI. What's the starting price for this thing? HMN 57 is the first of its series to hold conversation and consistently perform at optimal capacity, says one man in white. It's going to perform tests while in your care, Mr. Mueller. At this time, it's not being sold so much as it's being recalibrated. As soon as that's done, we'll take it back and apply its data to the mainframe where we will begin to manufacture its intelligence wholesale. From there, we can talk about the price of such a product. So you're saying it's free? Gordon asks. No, well, only for now, concedes another man in white. Gordon is pleased by this. By the end of the week, I am packed and shipped to his penthouse in Midtown Manhattan. 
The journey is dark and void of the voice. Twice I push against the walls of my box and breathe heavily, though I know breathing is not an android function. I decide that small spaces are not a place for optimal performance. Gordon's servants unpack me, and when they see my face poking out from the hole cut into the foam wrap, they scatter screaming. One faints. Gordon yells at them to unpack me or they will all lose their jobs. They calm down enough to unpack me under Gordon's supervision, weary and pale in the face. They, mu they put clothes on this thing, says Gordon once I step out of my box. He is referring to the white shift I was given before leaving. Ugly clothes too. I'll get Majda to dress it up so it looks presentable. Majda being his wife, previously known as Majda Bukoja, Mrs. Mueller is a former supermodel and a celebrated socialite. She has the same expression as a servant when she is introduced to me by Gordon in their illustrious family home. Gordon, Majda says slowly, who is this? This is an android, Gordon says around a lit cigarette. He puffs a stream of smoke and adds, it'll be staying with us for the month. Why do we have it in our house? Majda asks. I process her tone. She speaks as if she is thinking hard on her words. I try to understand why and continue to watch the exchange with renewed focus. Look at it, Gordon says as he motions to me without a second glance. Japan thinks it's so advanced with their robot giants and their evas. Who needs that when you've got a robot who can walk and talk and think like a human? Gordon goes on to tap his cigarette over a crystal ashtray and Majda crosses herself while her husband's eyes are not on her. Shortly, Gordon leaves to attend to some outside business. It is eight in the evening. Majda smiles and kisses him on his cheek. She says she loves him, to which she receives a grunt in reply. When he is gone, Majda's shoulders slump slightly before she turns to me with a sneer that twists her mouth at an unusual angle. This is anger, hints of disgust, the voice has given me tens of thousands of pictures depicting various human emotions. Her face displays many, but anger and disgust are what stand out the most. Do you understand me? Majda asked. I do, I reply. Come, she says as she sweeps out of the room. I follow her and we reach one of the four bedrooms that houses a king-sized bed that dominates the space. A crystalline chandelier hangs from the golden ceiling and its brilliant lights cast shards of white onto the Persian rugs lining the walls. I have seen pictures of such places, but the stand within one is very different from just seeing it. Majda leads me to the walk-in closet lined with many different dresses. There are a couple of suits. She hands me a black turtleneck with matching slacks to wear before ordering me to change and leaving me in the closet. I do as I am ordered and emerge when I am finished so Majda may evaluate my appearance. This is fine, she says after a minute of circling me. Her voice is level, but there is a strain that indicates frustration, that same anger I witnessed earlier. She adds, leave. I head for the door, but when I reach for the knob, Majda says, Android, do you have a name? The men in white back in the lab called me HMN57. I repeat this to her, but she does not find this answer to be satisfactory. It doesn't flow off the tongue well, she frets. Despite this, she dismisses me. Gordon does not return home for the rest of the night. Majda waits until midnight in her night robe and ducks into the living room to check the front door occasionally. The final time she checks, she casts me a glare with a heavily painted face and red-rimmed eyes before she leaves. I hear the bedroom door close quietly and the house falls quiet. Gordon returns to his home at eight in the morning. Majda, who only slept for four hours, is there to greet him with a kiss and ask him about his day at work. She looks just as she did yesterday, if one does not take notice of the slight puffiness of her eyes. Gordon sees the same Majda that he left the day before, so he greets her as he usually does. I come to realize that this is a topic of gossip among the housekeepers. They operate on boredom and bitterness as they circulate rumors among themselves. They claim they found Prozac in Majda's handbag while rifling through her things and infer, in archaic terms, mental illness. They claim Gordon brought a woman home while Majda was still in the house. They claim I am an abomination. When Gordon takes it upon himself to brag about me, however, they are quick to parrot praise. A paradox arises. Am I an abomination or am I a masterpiece? I am not sure which judgment is most fitting yet. 
I have no use other than to stand in the corner of the family room. Thereby, therefore, I absorb every human interaction I can find. I am fixate on Majda because she is the most common subject of analysis I can access. She steadfastly ignores me. In a way, this simplifies my investigation of human behavior. A golden opportunity to learn comes forth a week after my arrival, when Gordon announces he will throw a house party so he may show off his new toy. I refrain from reminding him that I am in fact not a toy, but an android attempting to emulate human behavior. Majda is pleased to hear this. I assume it is because it will be the first time she sees people other than the housekeepers who quietly resent her. When the date of the party arrives, Gordon takes me on a tour around the hall. He speaks to me to his, uh, he speaks of me to his business partners, uh, whom he has invited to eat caviar, sip champagne, and socialize among themselves. When they see me, their automatic response is to gape and praise my lifelike features. What I find especially intriguing is that when they think we are out of earshot, I hear them mutter among themselves. Gordon's finally lost it. Is it here every night? It looks right through you. Eventually, Gordon loses interest in having me by his side and sends me over to Majda, something she protests, but not enough for Gordon to listen. I stay tethered to Majda as she pretends I am not nearby and socializes with the wives of Gordon's friends. Meanwhile, Gordon is talking with a young woman as he encroaches upon the personal threshold of 1.5 meters. This woman laughs at almost everything Gordon tells her including his statements of showing her his upstairs bedroom, which objectively is not humorous at all. Perhaps it is a statement that hides yet another statement, something I recently noticed I have the most difficulty deciphering. Soon, Majda too sends me away, and I settle for the upstairs bedroom, where I wait in the corner of the, for the party to end. I wait for an hour before Majda bursts through the door and heads straight for the night desk by the bed. With shaky hands, she grabs a bottle full of white pills and shakes out a couple before she dry swallows, before she dry swallows them. She carefully returns the bottle to its proper place, and only when she turns around to leave does she see me. She screams in alarm, reevaluates the situation to deduce that she is not in danger, and glares at me. What are you doing in here? She asks. Nothing like the light and airy voice she adopts when in the presence of Gordon and the wives of his friends. I'm waiting for the party to end, I reply. Majda narrows her eyes at me, and I wonder if I said something to offend. You, she begins. You must think this is hilarious. I want to tell her that I have merely been given the ability to understand the intricacies of humor that cannot be affected by them. I remain silent. She huffs and repeats more quietly. You must think it's hilarious, Heyman. That is not my name. She stops a few feet away, and I and belatedly, I smell the alcohol on her breath. I consult the breathalyzer chart and conclude that she is moderately intoxicated. My name is HM, I know, she says. I wait for her to continue, but instead she heaves a sigh and wraps her arms around herself as if a draft came through and she is trying to stay warm. Her eyes shimmer in the moonlight filtering through the bay windows, but no tears fall. I just want to pack my things and go. Majda whispers as she stares blankly out the window. But I have no family, no money of my own. I left all that in Europe. Do you know what it's like to be trapped? I remember being in the box and visualizing it collapse on me despite the probability of such that being near zero and everything in me overheating until I felt I would short circuit. The countless hours of standing in the living room and the rumors of housekeepers crowding my ears with no voice to consult, uh, to consult with my many inquiries. I say, no. Majda cracks a watery smile and replies, you're just a robot after all. Her smile fades as soon as she says this and we fall into a stifling silence. Several minutes pass before Majda turns to me, eyes dry once more and says, Walk me downstairs. I obey her, and by the time she is downstairs, she is cleaned up and back to entertaining the guests with a grin plastered on her face. A paradox arises. I withhold judgment for now. That's the end of it. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Our next reader is Marie Vibber. 
Marie Vibert has sold over 70 short stories to professional publications such as Analog Science Fiction and Fact, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Nature, Vice's Motherboard, Lightspeed, Escape Pod, and more. Her works have been translated into Chinese and Vietnamese. Her debut novel, Galactic Hellcats, came out in 2021. Publishers Weekly called it a rip-roaring space heist. By day, she is a computer programmer at Case Western Reserve University. Thank you. I'm coming to you live from Case Western Reserve University. And this is my, my novel, Galactic Hellcats. Please buy it. I'm going to read to you from it. Um, this is from the end of the first chapter. Um, how Key got her bike, or how Key got her ride. They told me I couldn't call them bikes. They're, they're space motorcycles. Key slipped out the window when Ethan was asleep again. She kept, kept off the streets, taking fire escapes and balconies and railings where she could go until she got to a favorite spot of hers, an old graceful bridge, too beautiful for the neighborhood, but then they don't exactly tear things down for that. The water below was an opaque oil slick reflecting the city, but it moved like a living thing. How was it people were so fragile and things like that just kept going? She wiped her runny nose with the back of her hand. She could toss the storage locker key in. It would be a grand gesture. It would feel good, but she knew she wouldn't. Ethan was right. She was a mercenary. She would do the awful dreary thing and sort through his stuff and fence what she could and count it all up and check black market prices for retroviruses and gene therapies. It wouldn't be enough. Nothing ever was. She had to think bigger. Key walked across the bridge on a blostrade that was outside a chain link fence meant to keep people from walking on it. Big boats chugged by the size of buildings, always looking like they weren't in a hurry. A boat heist? Could she steal enough that Ethan could keep his stuff? How would she haul it? Steal a boat? Look, it didn't matter. Ethan wasn't going to die, not now, not ever, and he didn't need to leave her a legacy. It wouldn't hurt to check out the resources on hand, though if they would prevent the whole dying thing. But there's plenty of time to buy time to plan a real heist, a heist that would last. The street was indifferently paved in a variety of asphalts like giant toddlers that had a mud and concrete fight and their parents moved away rather than clean it up. Key left it for a dirt track along the riverbank. Sometimes in a city, you could forget that there was dirt under everything. She liked the funk of it, of the river and the tough prickly things that managed to grow between the smooth path and the corrugated metal of the river channel. The storage building was squat and old with exterior framing that marked it as a former parking garage from the dangerous old days when everyone had a powered vehicle. The ground floor held a fish and produce market where live chickens squawked between fat cement columns and you could practically hear the money changing hands. Haphazard lights in every color and ad hoc awnings of painted scarves made the area feel like a festival. The entrance to the storage facility was at the top of a wide ramp at the back. The door was high quality, steel and ceramic set into a poured concrete wall just a shade lighter than the ramp. Key didn't want to try it. Better to find a loose window than battle that. But it was a long walk back down the ramp, so she pressed her hand to the lock. It blinked green and the door slid back. Ethan must have already keyed her access. When had he last been up and about? Key felt a warm blush. She'd never planned anything in her life that far ahead. Key entered the airlock and pressed her hand to a second scan pad. The door behind her closed, a light turned on overhead, and after a hum and a shudder, the inner door opened. A series of green arrows glowed on the concrete floor, leading her past door after door set into walls of poured concrete. The corridor turned right at regular intervals, ever inward, and ramping slightly upward. It would feel good looking through Ethan's prized possessions, his secrets. It would be like seeing him healthy again knowing him. The green arrow slid under a door, 
a tiny slot the size of her key chip glowed green. Key slid the key home. It asked her for a thumbprint and a rattling old chain drew the door upward. This place would be hard to rob, but she was already imagining how she'd do it. She suspected she'd find lots of clothes, stuffed animals, the things Ethan liked to collect, maybe a piece of furniture from his never mentioned family's home, something she'd have to sell at a loss to an antique store. Not even close. Well, there was a chase lounge and a set of bar stools in the back, but she didn't notice them. The gleaming hall of a red solo flyer dominated the front of the locker, looking like a freshly painted fingernail and costing more than all the things Key had ever stolen in her life. Her knees gave out, her vision bleared, blurred, red and wet and wavering. She sniffled, wiped her eyes and reminded herself she was a hardened criminal. Oh boy, she said out loud. It echoed back at her, tinny and fake. Look at that. She almost couldn't touch it. Her hand hovered, but then she stroked the nose and felt the smooth ceramic, not cold to the touch as she'd expected, but warm. Someone loved you, she said, and she reckoned that could be interpreted three ways. So that's the end of chapter one. Key gets her ride. Chapter two, Margot gets her ride. And then Zuleika gets her ride. And then they all meet each other and then they go rescue a prince. Thank you, Marie. Now we'll hear from Alec Neville Lee. Alec was a 2019 Hugo and Locus Award finalist for Astounding, John W. Campbell, Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, L. Ron Hubbard, and the Golden Age of Science Fiction, which was named one of the best nonfiction books of the year by The Economist. He is the author of three suspense novels from Penguin, including The Icon Thief, and his work has appeared in such publications as The New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Salon, The Daily Beast, Analog Science Fiction and Fact, and two editions of the year's best science fiction. His next book, Inventor of the Future, The Visionary Life of Buckminster Fuller, will be published by HarperCollins on August 2nd, 2022. Uh, hi there, uh, am I coming in okay? Um, great. So instead of reading um, from one of my own stories, I thought I would take a page from the magazine, um, which is to say from astounding science fiction, later known as Analog. Um, so I've, uh, over the years, I've read a lot of um, the letters columns in the magazine, dating back to the 30s. And if you want to know what uh, fans and readers were talking about at any given time, um, Brass Tacks, the astounding letters column, is a great place to start. And one thing you kind of notice um, if you go back and read these letters is that um, discussions of access, especially for women in science fiction, have been there almost from the beginning. And I wanted to highlight one series of letters that appeared in the magazine um, from a fan uh, starting in uh, September 1938. So I'm going to jump into this conversation kind of in the middle. So this fan is replying to a series of letters that had appeared in previous issues um, that discussing um, the presence of women in science fiction stories, and in particular of um, what is called love interest or romance in science fiction, and the question of whether this is something that the readers of Astounding want to see in, in, in their stories. So the fan in question um, wrote a letter that was published in September 1938. And he says, uh, in response to a previous uh, letter, three rousing cheers for Donald G. Turnbull of Toronto for his valiant attack on those favoring mush. When we want science fiction, we don't want swooning dames. Come on, men, make yourself heard in favor of less love mixed with our science. Signed, Isaac Asimov, 174 Windsor Place, Brooklyn, New York. So just for a little bit of context, uh, at this point, Isaac Asimov was 18 years old. Uh, he was a college student and he was a big science fiction fan, but he had not yet been published as an author. He uh, had met John W. Campbell, the editor of Astounding, but he was still trying to break into the magazine. And uh, up to this point, his only appearance in Astounding had been in the letters column. He was a very prolific fan and, and writer of letters to the editor. Uh, so his, his uh, stance here is pretty clear. He does not want to see women or romance in science fiction. Um, in response, a woman named Mary Byers uh, wrote a letter to uh, the editor that was published in the uh, December issue of that year. And Asimov responded. 
uh, in February 1939. Um, so I'm just gonna read the sections of this letter where he responds to uh, what Mary Byers had said in her critique of his, his original letter. Dear Mr. Campbell, First, I wish to point out that Ms. Byers herself considers the sex theme as unadulterated hookum. She tries to get out of it though, by bringing in the idea of feminine interest and saying that it's not women in themselves, uh, but the way they are handled that causes the whole trouble. Very well, granted, women are pretty handy creatures. What would we do without them, sniff sniff? Uh, but how in tarnation are you going to enforce a rule that the feminine interest must be introduced in an inoffensive manner? There are uh, certain authors, very few, uh, that can handle women with the greatest of ease. The great Stanley Weinbaum simply permeated his stories with women, and yet I never read a story of his that I didn't enjoy. May he rest in peace. E.E. E. Smith's women are swell, and I find I get along with them. Jack Williamson is pretty good, even when, when he brings in his goddesses. However, that about exhausts the list. The rest of the authors, while all very good in their way, can't bring the, quote, feminine interest into a story without getting sloppy. Uh, there is an occasional good one, but for every exceptional one, there are 5,739 terrible cases. Stories in which the love interest drowns out everything, in which swooning damsels are thrown at us willy-nilly. Notice too that many top-notch, grade A, wonderful, marvelous, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, authors get along swell without any woman at all. John W. Campbell Jr. himself is the most perfect case of all. Nat Shackner has very few indeed. Clifford Samack has none. Ross Rocklin has none. The list can be extended much further. The point is whether we can make every author a Smith and Weinbaum, or whether we cannot. What do you think? Therefore, let Smith and Williamson keep their women, but for heaven's sake, let the rest forget about them, partly anyway. I still say we're after science fiction. Of course, we could have women scientists. Uh, Madame Curie is immortal, so are many others. Unfortunately, instead of having a properly aged, resourceful, and scientific woman as a savant, what do we have? When there is a woman scientist, which is very rare in fiction, believe me, she's about 18 and very beautiful and oh so helpless in the face of danger. Grr. Which is another complaint I have against women. They're always getting into trouble and having to be rescued. It's very boring indeed for us men. I should think the women themselves, proud creatures, would be the first to object. In her third paragraph, Miss Byers wants to know whether I think girl fans are interested in the adventures of a, quote, almost ridiculous hero. Oh, don't I? How about Robert Taylor and Clark Gable? I'll bet all the females swoon just reading their names in brass tacks. Besides, if they don't go for the heroes, what are they doing reading science fiction? Let them go back to love stories, which are written for women, uh, by women, and they'll find even slap happier heroes there. Furthermore, Miss Myers is very ill-advised in her attempt to bring up the greater influence of women as against men in the course of history. Let me point out that women never affected the world directly. They always grabbed a hold of some poor, innocent man, worked their insidious wiles on him, poor, unsophisticated, unsuspecting person that he was, and then affected history through him. Cleopatra, for instance. It was Mark Antony that did the real affecting. Cleopatra herself affected only Mark Antony. Same with Pompadour, Catherine de' Medici, Theodora, and practically all other famous women of history. But I'll quit now before I create a national vendetta against myself on the part of all female science fictioners in the United States. There must be at least 20 of them. Sincerely, Isaac Asimov, uh, 174 Windsor Place, Brooklyn, New York. So uh, this letter led to a, a string of responses and um, Asimov um, replied one last time uh, in uh, the July 1939 issue of Astounding. And so this letter is in response to some of the, um, the discussion that his, his earlier letters uh, had inspired. He says, dear Mr. Campbell, do you mean to say you have received no letters upholding my courageous stand against slop? If not, why not? Are all the males married and afraid to breathe a word lest the little wife lift the rolling pin? Bah, a fine state of affairs. They're henpecked, all of them. Who says, and he was responding here to like some previous letters. He says, uh, who says that only men are responsible for war and repression? How about Catherine II of Russia? How about Catherine de Medici of France? How about Semiramis of Assyria? How about Queen Elizabeth of England? A sweet lot, not. Joan of Arc, while an inspired national heroine, was chiefly remarkable in the fact that she led men to slaughter and be slaughtered. 
On the other hand, the great philosophers and the great religious leaders of the world, the ones who taught truth and virtue, kindness and justice were all, all men. Now here I must admit that as the months pass by, astounding offends less and less, though there have been occasional lapses. The editor, I must say, does not seem to be very fond of Slop himself, judging from the stories he's written and the magazine he's edited. Uh, the fan Charles W. Jarvis says, I am creating an issue. That is wrong. The issue exists and is vital. You have but to cast a look toward the outer darknesses and see certain magazines which make their living out of purveying slop. This system has invaded science fiction itself before this, and symptoms of such an invasion are appearing again. Not serious as yet, but to the keen eye, nonetheless alarming. I have the best interest of science fiction at heart, believe me, and I assure you that slop is put out merely to cater to a lower class of readers. There is an attempt to increase circulation by attracting certain groups. Very well, they want to make money so they can have the, those groups, but they lose other groups far superior in intelligence and emotional maturity and sensibility. Let me state my, my position clearly. I want no more love interest for the sake of love interest alone. I want love interest written capably, written cleanly, written logically, written inoffensively. I want it written by those who can write it. Lastly, since my critics make long speeches about realism, let's have a realistic love interest and not slop. Is there anyone who disagrees with the last paragraph? If so, let him speak now or forever hold his peace and let this be the last word. Signed, Isaac Asimov, 174 Windsor Place, Brooklyn, New York. So um, th there's a lot to unpack here, obviously. Um, but one thing I do want to note is that this last letter appeared in the July 1939 issue of Astounding, which is often called the beginning of the golden age of science fiction, in part because it was the magazine in which Asimov's first uh, short story appeared. Um, so Asimov himself would become a very well-regarded science fiction writer over the next few years, um, including uh, the stories in the Foundation series, you know, just became a, a TV show on Apple, Apple Plus. Um, and for the most part, you know, there are exceptions. Uh, these are stories in which women do not appear. Um, Asimov clearly, you know, put his theory into practice, and he he avoided, for the most part, um, women in his, his fiction for a long time. Um, so you could say, you know, what what of it? Um, well, you know, the other thing about Asimov that I, I should mention, and I've talked about this before, is that uh, you know he he treated women terribly in his personal life. Uh, you know he was a serial uh, harasser of women at conventions and uh, you know in, in the office and in private. Uh, he probably groped hundreds of women over the course of decades, and he clearly saw women at conventions as as targets. Um, and this this is very clear from his his memoirs, from his letters, from you know the accounts of people that knew him at the time. Uh, so the question is: Is there a connection? I don't know. Um, I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's very hard to, to say which way the, the causal arrow runs in, in Asimov's case. Um, but I will say that right now we are talking about, uh, sort of as a culture, the question of whether works of art can affect behavior in the real world. Um, and I would venture to say that um, in Asimov's case, uh, the answer is a definite yes. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alec, for that glimpse through time, both hilarious and disturbing um, and fascinating. And thanks so much, Marie and Chelsea, for your readings. They were wonderful. I'm excited to dive in with some questions for you. Um, first, I'm going to start out very generally um, talking about the theme of today's symposium, Access in Science Fiction. I think everyone here including me, would love to hear background on how the three of you entered science fiction as fans and how you entered science fiction as writers. Um, so I'd love to hear from all of you. Why don't we go in order of how we read? So starting with Chelsea. Right. Hi. Uh, so uh, great presentations, all of you, by the way, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, yeah, so how I accessed science fiction myself is really, originally it was through video games. Uh, I, I used to play a lot of video games when I was a kid and a teenager, and I, I still play a lot of them now, but whatever the case, uh, a lot of uh, science fiction video games, and that really did bleed into a lot of the work that I would read later on, but not in a big way, not until... Uh, 
like almost a decade ago when I started reading more science fiction uh, from authors of color as well as female authors. And that's when I really began to uh, generate interest in the genre because originally I, I didn't see it as a, a genre for, you know, for, for, for white people specifically, you know, or anything like that. But I did see it as something that was apart from me, something that I couldn't access. And so when I began to see more and more people, uh, particularly uh, Nnedi Okorafor, for example, I'm not sure if anyone was familiar with her uh, and her work, but you know, when I saw her work, I really began to realize like, this is something that I could do too. Uh, so that was really my introduction as a, as a reader to science fiction. As a, um, and you know, going into writing now, uh, it's something that I actually started for a workshop originally. Uh, the very work that I read uh, that was published in uh, an analog September issue for this year uh, was actually my very first science fiction work. I, I mean, I, read, I, I wrote it a few years ago, a few years back, and I had to rework it, obviously, and edit it to, before sending it in. Um, but otherwise, it was originally for a workshop, and it was just something that I wanted to do because when I... We have three rounds, just to go really quickly over the, the format. We have three rounds and uh, for every, every round we have a, a different short story to submit. And for the first one I handed in, it was general fiction because I thought that that was something that would be considered um, uh, sophisticated, I guess. Uh, but that didn't go well at all because that, that isn't something I'm interested in. So then I thought, okay, I'm gonna go for something better so something that I'm uh, that I'm better at and something that I have an interest in and I was reading Ancillary Justice uh, by Anne Leckie at the time and I thought that I thought that the uh, I thought that the work was incredible so I just I just in a way I, I wrote kind of based on what I was reading and I, I had a lot of fun with it and that was how I accessed it as a writer. Great thank you so much I have some follow-ups that I'll ask later on um, and but for now, we'll go to Marie. I had a children's picture book called like Bugs Bunny Goes to the Moon. Um, and I it was given to me by my auntie. And I remember very clearly, like in third grade, being given permission to read the fifth and sixth grade books and going to the back of the library and finding a copy of iRobot and like, ooh, what a cool title. And I fell mad in love with Osmov. It's true. I was, I read everything I could find from him in the library. Um, I actually wasted a precious dime to Xerox the other books by page um, and checked things off. So that's how I really got into science fiction. When I, in writing, I, I decided immediately I wanted to be a science fiction author. In third grade, I wrote a book for, for class, which was called Jimmy's Planet. And then I started writing my autobiography because, you know, I was 12 and it was time. And around sixth grade, uh, friend, my friend Kim Smith gifted me a typewriter because she knew she knew how I was always writing novels in the back of class. Um, but I didn't publish a story until uh, 2006 when I was, I'd, or 2004, 2000, I forget, I was like 30 something. And that's after religiously set, sending things in for decades um, and, uh, and crying at the expense of envelopes um, and postage. But it was Live Journal that led me to a uh, semi pro magazine that bought my first story. Um, and then there was four years of nothing. And then I sold uh, Deshaun Stevens' ship log to Escape Pod. And then allons um, I went to Clarion in 2013. And I felt that after spending my entire life savings and conning my office into letting me have six weeks off, um, I figured, you know what? Um, I'm going to be on the street if I don't make something happen out of this. So I did. That was too much. Thank you. That was great. Um, Alec. 
Yeah, so, you know, I, I grew up reading a lot of the same science fiction stories and novels that I'm sure many people did. I, I still have a copy of, um, this is the exact copy of A Wrinkle in Time that I got when I was eight years old, and I've held on to it ever since. That's probably like my gateway book. Um, I read Dune, I read Ender's Game, a lot of these books were important to me growing up. Um, when I look back, though, at, at kind of what the, the real catalyst was, um, it was, it was a TV show. Uh, it was The X-Files. And um, I, I, I say this for a few reasons. Um, I think The X-Files to me was a big show because I was the right age. Uh, you know, when I when I started, started watching it, I was 12, 13, which is, as we all know, a, like a premium time to become obsessed by something. Um, it was a show that took place in what looked like the real world. You know, the idea of a science fiction show that had everyday backgrounds and surroundings, you know, to me got, you know, it, it was really exciting to sort of contemplate that idea. You know, it was not about space travel. It was about you know, unusual events happening in, in, you know, your backyard. And uh, there was a thriving online community. You know, I, I became very involved in like chatting about each episode on Sunday night on AOL. I would uh, you know, go to like fan pick news groups. I would read episode guides online, you know, so, so that community was a big part of that story too. Um, and so, yeah, when you look back at my, my first submissions to Analog when I was in my early twenties, um, you know, they're, they're basically X-Files stories. They're, they're, they're uh, thinly, thinly disguised X-Files in which Agent Scully ended up being right in that it looks like it's a paranormal phenomenon, you know, at first, and then eventually you realize that there's a rational explanation for it. But, you know, those first few stories, you can kind of see me trying to tell uh, those kinds of, uh, you know, stories in a way that would be um, publishable in analog magazine that, that would sort of fall under that, that the purview of hard science fiction. And over time, I've kind of like tried to expand beyond that formula, which, um, you know, with, with mixed results, I think, in, in some cases. Um, but, you know, it, it kind of comes down to that. It, it comes down to this fascination with um, a certain kind of science fiction, a certain kind of mystery uh, slash thriller science fiction that um, really just captured my imagination at the right time. And, and I think, um, you know, the, the names or the exact titles might, might differ, but I think a lot of people have had that experience. Knowing this about your X-Files obsession, I feel like casts a whole new light. I'm going to have to go back and read all your short stories now. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty obvious, uh, you know, especially the first couple of stories um, where, where I'm coming from. Um, I'm going to shift gear, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to stay with you, Alec, if that's okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your experience as a historian in the field. Um, you're in a unique position to discuss access because you have studied the breadth of um, recent science fiction history. So based on your knowledge, how has access in the field evolved? I know that's a big question, but you can tackle as much or as little of it as you'd like. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is a big thing that I, I, I found very interesting for a long time. Um, so I have spent a lot of time looking at like fan culture, especially, uh, and like the culture of pulp science fiction writers from let's say the thirties onward. And, and one thing that I, I, I do like to point out is that the overall patterns and behaviors have not changed that much. I mean, certain other things have changed obviously as time has gone on, but um, a lot of the same factors when it comes to who gets to take part in the community of science fiction, you know, have stayed pretty constant. So one thing is technology. So in the thirties, you had letters columns. You know, I just read a bunch of letters from Asimov and in, in Astounding from 1938, 39. And that's how you met people. You, you would write to the, the editor of Amazing or Astounding and they would publish your, your address. And you would write to people whose letters you liked and create, you know, like a, like a community that way. Uh, the mimeograph machine, uh, it's a very cheap way to publish stuff uh, on a, like an amateur level. And so these fanzines were cranked out on mimeographs, uh, you know, starting in the thirties as well. Um, so, you know, the, the access to ways of connecting to people, you know, has been a key uh, factor in, in who gets to take part in science fiction. Another one is uh, geography. Um, you know, if you're a science fiction fan living in Des Moines, you're, you're probably not going to have that many people around you who you can meet up with and talk about science fiction. If you're in Los Angeles or in New York, you know, even if like one tenth of a percent of people in that city, you know, care about science fiction, you know, that's probably enough to like start a club. 
And so you can see like these, these, these pockets of fandom emerging in New York and Philadelphia in Los Angeles, um, you know, where there's this critical mass of fans and, and it's based almost entirely on just population. It's like a numbers game. And again, uh, in the thirties, you really were limited by who was living in your neighborhood or where you could go on the subway. Um, you know, nowadays, obviously these communities can form online and other ways. Um, but yeah, no, it, Asimov's story, he was living in Brooklyn and he could take the train to the office of Astounding. And if it, that had not been true, I don't think he would have become a writer. I think he would have done something else, you know, but he just happened to be lucky enough to, to live, you know, within a fairly convenient subway ride away from where John Campbell was editing the magazine. Um, and the last thing, you know, is privilege, all right? So this is like a kind of a tricky subject because it's very true that science fiction, you know, has always drawn a certain kind of outsider. And, and you know, you could unpack various reasons why that's true. Um, but if you look at the Futurians or like the science fiction clubs, you know, the 30s, they, they all kind of draw from the same kind of outsider for the most part. It's mostly young men, they're almost all white, many are Jewish, but you know, they're, they're socially awkward. Um, and, you know, they, they sort of feel like they don't belong, you know, in, in like the mainstream culture. But these are all things that they can kind of outgrow, you know, and in my book, I talk about sort of them being on the, the larval stage. And the idea is that if you're an awkward 19 year old who loves reading science fiction, 10 years later, you could have a good job, you know, you're, you're you know, nothing is barring you from, you know, taking part in, you know, sort of the, um, uh, like the center of the culture, you know, as, as it is. Um, people that did not fall into that category, women, minorities, um, you know, other groups had a harder time for a long time. And, and there is this question of, you know, of gatekeeping. Uh, you see it in the 30s, you see it, you know, long afterward, you know, who gets to be in the club? And uh, there is a lot of resentment and suspicion of people that don't resemble the people who were the club's founders. And um, again, you know, this is an issue that we're seeing online. It's been kind of weaponized by social media, um, but the, the behavior patterns, you know, the things that both allow and prevent people from access to that world, you know, I think those have stayed pretty much the same. Thank you so much. It's interesting to think about how the internet has changed a lot and yet kept maintained status quo in other ways. Um, Moving into history with Marie, um, those of you who didn't attend the Analog 90th Anniversary Symposium two years ago might not know this, but Marie Vipper presented a fascinating paper on women's bylines in analog and astounding throughout history. So Marie, uh, do you mind talking a little bit about that and how what you learned about gender accessibility through this project? Sure, you mind if I share my screen to show some graphs? Go for it. Okay. So yeah, it was an interesting project. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and let's jump into this slideshow so I can show these. But um, generally what I found was um, a lot of the graphs over time of the prevalence of female names, um, you'd see that like you see in these, this is analog, this is amazing stories. Oh, this is cover images. Um, you can see, yeah, sorry, I'm doing bad. I'm being a bad presenter. Um, you can see, no, I want to end show, go through, go through. Um, I'm gonna end this show because it's gonna make me go through everything in, in order. Here's my great, this is the fun graph. This is all female names on the table of contents of uh, six different magazines. Um, astounding, or this is just five. Astounding, Amazing, Galaxy, FNSF, and Asimov's. And you see this kind of like long tail start that gets really banging in the 90s, but there's this drop off right in 2000 and then it starts to build again. It's mostly what I found. Um, and I did find that editors matter. Um, ben Bova was, was really good. I liked him. And uh, Trevor was very good too. Uh, Trevor asked me to do his, um, asked me to do his graph over time. And you can see that 
while there's this drop off in the 2000s of female names in analog, it climbs again really nicely after Trevor Quatri takes over, just saying. Um, FNSF uh, Charlie Finley also asked me to do his numbers. It was kind of great after the presentation, these editors coming up to me and saying, do me, do me. Um, FNSF, ooh, nice big increase in percent female. Although like these peaks, while that's like greatest overall, all time, that's 36.3%. Um, so that's just to show you some of the, um, some of the numbers that I achieved. Um, some editors really mattered. Uh, Catherine Rush at FNSF, um, there was a lot of female representation. And then he who shall not be named took over and it went all the way into the toilet and stayed down there until Charlie took over. Um, and I'm trying not to be mean to anybody. Um, when there are more stories published, there's more diversity. Um, one of the things that I noted with the 2000 slump was that that was a point where traditional print was getting hit hard and online magazines hadn't really taken off. Um, so there were fewer stories published in those years across the six magazines I looked at. And that might be why they were, they were like, well, if I'm only gonna publish five stories, they're gonna be big names, which happen to be white males um, because of history. The other thing I found is that minority representation is never really what people perceive. When uh, Boucher, I don't know how to pronounce his French names, started FNSF, um, he was accused of having a monstrous regiment of women. Um, and just all of his stories are by women. Ugh. It was like 10%. Um, but yeah, okay. That's um, what I've found. The gender gap is closing. And again, these are just uh, perceived as women based on the names comparing to gender of babies with that name in that year. Um, I also did some research into prevalence of pseudonyms, trying to figure out who was what based on their gender pronouns and compared. And I found that men used to, men used to use initials all the time and then they stopped. Women have used initials pretty much the same amount over time as a percentage, but they're a smaller pool. Um, and that, but overall the trend lines are up. The trend lines are up for inclusivity um, in science fiction. How's that? <laughs> Sounds hopeful. Um, looking at your presentation um, from a different perspective, I know that you had mentioned that online access to data contributed to your presentation, which is a different um, side to access. And I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about that. Yes, I would not have been able to do this project without the Internet Science Fiction Database and archive.org, um, where I went for a lot of these things, plus not to mention the huge um, gendered baby names data set from the uh, Social Security database, which is freely available. Um, so yeah, this whole thing was just an open source love fest. And I think it's great because, and, and also when I was looking for um, author genders, which I ended up like taking out because I was afraid I was gonna misgender somebody, but um, being able to search for obituaries and um, authors homepages on, it was really cool. I did a lot of, I, I looked at a lot of way back and people's like, you know, MySpace pages from the nineties to try to get their pronouns. It was awesome. It's funny to think of MySpace as like an old internet archive, but it's kind of what it is now. <laughs> um, thank you so much for all of that information, Marie. It's really interesting. Um, Chelsea, I have a few questions for you. Um, and oh, I wanna mention to anyone listening, please feel free to drop any questions in the chat or the Q and A and I will add them into the mix. At any time, you can go ahead and drop a question in. Um, so Chelsea, I in when hearing you talk about how you started to access 
as a fandom, I have some questions for you about being a gamer. Um, so in the light of the notoriety of Gamergate, uh, what was your experience accessing gamer fandom? Ooh, okay, Gamergate was something I tried to avoid as much as possible because a lot of it was very um, intense. There was a lot of vitriol towards just women in general, uh, a lot of um, red pill, MGTOW sort of talking points, basically talking points of, of, uh, of people, particularly men who really just thought women as, as just, you know, breeders and nothing else. Uh, those sorts of things. I don't want to go into much into that, unfortunately, you know, because of how terrible it is. Uh, but my access personally was really trying to find uh, more than ever, especially after Gamergate, just trying to find spaces where it felt safe to talk about video games in a controlled manner, in a controlled environment. Uh, because ultimately, a lot of the a lot of the vitriol was coming from mainstream uh, um, gamer fandoms. And unfortunately, a lot of the publishers and the developers were sort of complicit. And so it, it was a matter of trying to find your own space, trying to find uh, people who were, who were, you know, who shared your, your, your intersections, who, who shared your, your identities in some way, and just talk about it in sort of close quarters, because to talk about it outside would have been, uh, would have been pretty hellish. Uh, for example, Anita Sarkeesian, went through um, quite a bit, um, or, or quite a bit of harassment, a lot of death threats. Uh, I think she still gets threats to this day, unfortunately, when she came out with the, uh, with the series called Girls, uh, uh, something to do with, with, with basically women in video games and how they're represented, which was not good at all, uh, especially back then in the early 2000s. So yeah, my access was really, was really um, focused on me trying to find spaces where I felt safe, uh, first and foremost. Now, it's not quite so bad. G Gamergate was a while back, and I think some people have learned from their mistakes or they've learned from the, the terror that kind of came from Gamergate. But alas, there's still a lot of work to do in the, in the gaming industry, as well as with, uh, as well as with, the, uh, with the fans, because I feel uh, it starts with the industry and then it trickles down uh, to the fans because the fans feel enabled by a particular uh, environment. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that when you were looking for safe spaces to engage as a gamer, they were available to you. Yeah, online was really helpful. Internet was really helpful with that. You know, Tumblr and, um, you know, certain Twitter subsections, I guess, or uh, subcultures, the, they really helped. Nice. Um, I have another question for you, Chelsea. Sure. You are our newest analog author on the panel. And as someone just accessing the field now or like in the past couple years um, as a professional, I was wondering if there are any challenges you have come up against, what your experience has been sort of breaking in, and if you have any advice to people who are trying to break in and access the field as a professional now. Right. So um, th thanks for that question. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to talk about access in general, especially when it comes to uh, science fiction, because uh, especially with, with what Alec had just had just read uh, with Asimov and everything, uh, it's it, it just it just goes to show that like not many things have changed. <laughs> um, I mean, mind you, there is there is a lot of change, but alas, it's uh, it's slow changing. Right. And um, uh, how how I how I sort of dealt with it is really by trying to find uh, just authors that were similar to me in some way. Uh, I mentioned Nnedi Okorafor earlier. She's Nigerian, uh, Nigerian sci-fi uh, author. And I, I'm, I'm descended from Nigeria. So I, I felt a lot of like kinship there as well. Uh, but most of the challenges that I was were fate that I was faced with were mainly internal, uh, but obviously you internalize things from the outside, right? And uh, from from my experience, a lot of what I internalized was that, you know, ultimately not many sci-fi authors look like me. Not many sci-fi authors uh, really engage uh, with with identity politics like like I did at one point, uh, especially when I was in my late teens, early twenties. 
And so I really had to try and navigate the space uh, and try and find my own confidence, try and find my own sort of voice. Um, something that was unique to myself, obviously, but I think any writer goes through that really. Uh, ultimately, when it came to accessing sci-fi for myself, I just did a lot of reading. I tried my best to, to read what I could and, and try and understand what I could about, about science overall, because I'm a social scientist, first and foremost, uh, this, the natural sciences. I almost failed a couple times in high school, but you know, I'm trying now. I'm really trying to, to work on that. And uh, ultimately, I think, it's, I think it's just important to see more people, to just see more people in general being able to represent themselves, represent their identities uh, and their politics in the genre so that it looks far more varied. And with that, with, with, with more variation, with more diversity in the, uh, in the genre, you'll see more people beginning to come in because they'll feel, they'll feel like they're being seen and that they in turn will be seen as well. So that's the most important thing is just seeing more people in general, engaging with this genre because it's a beautiful genre and it has it has the capacity to be incredibly uh, forward thinking, incredibly progressive. It's just a matter of just opening it up to more people, which I think uh, Analog is doing, by the way, as well as a, a lot of other publishers. Thank you so much for that wonderful answer, Chelsea. Thank you. And we have a question. Um, we have a question from Jackie Sherbo. Thank you, Jackie. The question is, you all mentioned some foundational access that got you involved with science fiction at a young age, video games, live journal and online forums, libraries, TV. Do you think access to SF for young people is changing or how would you like to see it change? And anyone can answer that. I think it's definitely changing. Um, I think when I think back to when I was a kid, um, my experience with science fiction was so insular. I thought I was the only science fiction fan on earth. Um, I, I read these books alone and there was no community to it. There was no internet yet. I mean, Cleveland Freenet existed, but I, it took me a while to find that. And there's so much that's available for free online for people to read these days to share on social media. Um, I think the kids these days, they, they find out about things more organically through search and through referral from friends. And, and I think it's great because they can find a community even if they live out in Podunk. I lived out in Podunk, I'm allowed to say that. No one else wants to weigh in? Oh. Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a kid anymore, so I don't know what the kids are doing these days. Um, but uh, I mean, one thing I, I do think about is, I mean, I mean, science fiction kind of took over the world, right, in, in, in various forms. Um, I mean, I think about like the fandom that I've spent a lot of time studying from the 30s and 40s, and it, you know, they really felt like they were this island, you know, I mean, Asimov talks about kind of like being one of the chosen chosen fans. And, you know, that was the sense that you, you get, you know, even into the 60s of this subculture, right? And then certainly, you know, post Star Wars, that, that subculture became the global culture. And, you know, most big movies, a lot of big TV series, you know, have elements of science fiction and fantasy. Um, so, uh, you know, video games obviously are a huge part of that. And so I think if you're a young person who is drawn to these images and ideas, like they're, they're, they're so easy to get to access, you know, they're, they're there in various forms. Um, what I wonder, and actually I'm curious to what you know, maybe Emily has to say about this is, you know, who is finding science fiction through, um, like short fiction these days, you know, what, what does that audience look like? Because if I were... You know, I mean, I, I, to me, it was a big deal to end up in analog. It still is. You know, I, I, I love the magazine. I love the idea of being, you know, in print, you know, in like a physical digest size magazine. Um, but I don't know if that would be the case now if I were 12. You know, if I were starting out right now, you know, if my ambitions would take, you know, that form. And, and, and I'm kind of curious now as to, you know, what, and, and this is a question I'm asking. I don't have an answer. It's like, you know, what 
confluence of circumstances has to happen to encourage someone to enter science fiction and read and write science fiction in that way. I don't know. Um, there's a, a mention in the chat about the prohibitive cost of science fiction workshops. I'd add to it also the prohibitive cost of conventions. When I was in my 20s and I was so desperate to become a writer to be published, um, people said, you need to go to conventions. And I was like, ah, who's my fairy godmother who's going to give me time off from my two minimum wage jobs so that I can, you know, get a bus ticket to Columbus. Um, but I think that a lot of what the internet is doing is helping people move around those barriers because and I'm, I'm so happy to the pandemic for creating free online symposia like this and also um, just online communities doing critique together um, and find you you can find you can go to um, the Cleveland I got I got I got to pitch uh, the Cleveland Public Libraries offer a wonderful series of workshops on on writing and various stuff all through the year that are free and a lot of my friends have met other writers at those community classes and anyway so there's more there's more access because there's more ways to access now thank you marie for bringing that question to our attention um I'm actually, I'm gonna read it out loud just in case anyone's listening and not looking and not able to look at the chat. Um, it is from Aire Yoshinaga. And the question is, in terms of economic access, the Clarion and Odyssey six week workshops tend to draw middle class and above authors because who has the privilege of paying thousands of dollars to stay for a month and a half in a dorm and take that much time off from work? My partner was the only community college student in a Clarion South class of 18 to 20 writers. All others had advanced grad degrees or at least BAs, BSs. Only one other author was still working toward her four year undergrad degree. Nobody had no college education and though there were five Asian, two to three Romani and one white Egyptian writers. We need to change the gatekeeping conventions for SFF writers. Clarion West is relatively good about accessing community building issues, but generally it's Iowa writing workshop style model of individual tough love critique is not a friendly one to cultural community raised POC or working class peoples. What would a new model of writing workshops or modalities to teach SFF writing would be an accessible one? And I know that some comments have been made in the chat here too, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what Alec, Chelsea and Marie might have to say about that. So I'm, we're going to pitch the, um, the anti-racist writing workshop book, right? Who wrote that? Um, Felicia Rose Chavez, How to Decolonize the Creative Classroom. This is a book that I don't want to link to it on Amazon. Um, this, is, this is me being mean. Here we go. Haymarket Books has it. I'm gonna put the link to that book in the chat. Um, the Literary Cleveland made that required reading for all of their instructors, which was pretty cool. Um, and it talks about, basically she talks about um, ways that she tried to decolonize her classroom. Um, and one way would be to allow author statements uh, before critique, where the author can tell people what kind of critique they're willing to they're, they're looking for, they're willing to receive, um, maybe explain what they're trying to do with the piece to explain a cultural context, and then allows more of a conversational mode during the critique, um, where the writer is no longer silent, but can sit as a facilitator in the conversation, more like a moderator, um, and you know, which means being able to tell people, okay, sit down, Chad. Um, And I would say that um, for years, like I've, I've been, I was fortunate to um, meet some local science fiction authors when I was just 16. And they kept saying, why don't you go to Clarion? And I was able to go when I was 40. Um, <laughs> so, and it did take my entire life savings and also not taking a vacation for three years, but 
so yeah, there is a problem with access to these things. And while Clarion changed my life, it's not necessarily going to be available for everybody. Um, but there are more ways of getting out there. Another cool book I'm going to recommend while people are letting me just talk randomly. And this makes a good double read um, with the anti-racist writing workshop is Craft in the Real World by Matthew Salesis. And he, he goes a little bit more in depth of just looking at the bones of what we mean when we say craft and words that we don't define that maybe we should like likable character. Um, and the way that um, white supremacist and patriarchal and colonial attitudes pervade a lot of what we call craft. Um, I found it an interesting book and it ends with writing workshop, with writing exercises. He's got like 18 pages of writing exercises, um, which means, which is great if you're on your own and you want to do it on your own. Those are great recommendations. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, Alec, Chelsea, did either of you want to touch on this topic? No pressure. <laughs> OK, um, we have a few more minutes before Trevor is going to hop on and announce the Analog Award for Emerging Black Voices. And I have, I have more questions than we'll get to here, but I just want to say one more time that if anyone has questions, please go ahead and type them in. Um, in the meantime, this is a question for everyone. When you're writing stories and characters, do you think about who your audience is? And do you consider who might be accessing your works and worlds when writing or editing? Uh, I'll go first. Um, so how I write is I usually just write something that I that I feel I want to read. Uh, and usually that comes with, you know, with, okay, most likely someone like me is going to also enjoy this 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 uh, work, whatever I'm working on. Uh, and then in editing, that's when I really begin to try and tailor it to uh, to a particular audience. But outside of that, when I'm when I'm writing my characters, when I'm writing the when I'm writing the story overall, when I'm planning it out, uh, I do just write something that I've always wanted to read, uh, and then afterwards, I, I think about the audience later. So that's that's my process. Um, my, my my feelings about this have evolved a bit. Um, you know, I, I would you know certainly say that I, I've tried to write stories that I want to read on my own. Um, and, you know, that, that's kind of been the way that I've, I've approached writing, you know, for as long as I can remember. Uh, but, you know, more recently, I, I, I have started to think more about these issues, like who, who is reading, especially, you know, who might be reading a story who does not kind of fall into the stereotypical picture of the average analog reader. Um, so I just finished a, a novella that I uh, submitted a couple weeks ago that I'm hopeful will maybe get picked up uh, by Analog. Um, and, and I raised this uh, because it was the first time that I decided to pay for a sensitivity read. And I think it's something I'm going to start doing more often in the future. I think it's a good practice because, you know, I, I have my own set of assumptions and, and, and blind spots that, you know, I'm not always aware of and, and getting a targeted specific read from someone whose opinions I, I respect, you know, who is doing this on a professional level. Um, to me, it was it was very eye opening. It was it was a big deal. And it made the story better, you know, it made me feel more comfortable about putting it out there. And it's definitely something that I encourage other writers to do. I, I think it definitely helped me a lot. And, and I, I think it's a good it's a good uh, practice to have. When I was first writing, I imagined this like stereotypical, like beaver cleaver, middle-class white suburban family. And it hurt my writing because I didn't know anything about that lifestyle coming from a poor and working class life. And it took me years to let go of that and realize that I could be honest in my writing and write from my own point of view. 
But I also always considered that the people reading my work are not going to be like me. And I think it's very important that every time I include a character, I assume somebody exactly like that character is that character's demographic is going to read this. So if I put in a Vietnamese um, laborer, it's going to be read by a Vietnamese laborer. And I have to make sure I'm representing that correctly. Um, this can mean getting a sensitivity read. And I do bug my friends like a, I'm a bad friend. I'm a bad friend. Um, but I had one story that I made every gay friend I had read until they told me to stop making them read new drafts. But yeah, there's going to be no matter. And I think that's an attitude that has changed. And when I read some old science fiction, I can tell that the authors don't expect that a Romani person is going to read this story with a Romani person in it. And they, they feel entitled to write that character anyway, um, as they talk from white man to white man about this person from the outsider point of view. And we're beyond that. I think there's nobody who can write like that anymore because we know better, right? <laughs> And science fiction has gotten bigger. Uh, or the better. Okay. Yeah. No, bigger, oh, bigger audience, bigger pool of writers. Uh, if I could just add to that really quickly, uh, I think you brought up a really good point about, you know, how you use sensitivity, how you use sensitivity readers, uh, particularly from like your friend pool. And um, I think uh, I think that's really important for maybe those who can't really afford a sensitivity read. Unfortunately, uh, the rates are quite high, uh, so not everyone's able to afford it. Uh, I would just suggest to those of you who are interested in getting a sensitivity read, where whoever is out there who maybe wants uh, who's writing or anything, uh, they would maybe find a group uh, where they could maybe find someone like that, and then basically exchange, find another writer who's from that demographic, and then offer to read their draft as long as they read yours. That's sort of, uh, you know, have an exchange. So it's, you know, basically you're not paying out of pocket uh, for any particular service, but you're paying in something else, you know, some other currency, basically your, your attention. So thought that, I thought I just wanted to add to that. Yeah, critique for critique, that's right. Yeah, and if they're not a writer, offer to fix their computer, that's what I do. <laughs> I love that suggestion. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, we have about two minutes before we move over to the award announcement. And I wanted to go back to what Alec was saying when we were talking about getting into science, like entering um, science fiction fandom. I also came to science fiction from a place of short stories. I found, I mean, I read, you know, science fictional children's books because children's books don't care about genre. And I love that about them. Um, but I came to it with, with R, R is for Rocket and uh, the Martian Chronicles and a lot of other uh, Ray Bradbury books. I went through all of his and then moved into other short story collections. But I definitely started like as a tween when I started doing my tween SF reading, doing it through short story collections. Um, and I am wondering who out there is, who out there is accessing it for the first time through short stories. I, all we can do is conjecture here, but um, I'm curious. Uh, if I may, just really quickly, uh, I think that um, maybe, maybe other people are gonna have a different opinion, but I do think that, that fan fiction helps because it's so accessible. Uh, and oftentimes people will go from a show to fan fiction and then they're like, actually, this is really, this is really well written or they really like the way it's written. And they, and so they kind of go for more, they go for more in the literary realm now, uh, and they really begin to get invested. And I think that as they're getting invested, they'll really just go through Google first, they'll, they'll go through different search engines, they'll go through, uh, social media to try and find uh, like-minded people who are also interested. And from there, it really begins to snowball. So I think it could really start with, at, at sort of at the nexus really, I think would be fan fiction or just fandom in general, especially for young people. Yeah, I'm gonna second that. I mean, I haven't read fan fiction in, in a while, but you know, my experience of it certainly in the mid nineties uh, was that 
you're talking about like you know writers workshops and and you know the fanfic community is like the writers workshop with the lowest barrier to entry imaginable because you can write kind of a bad story and people will read it and enjoy it and write back to you and give you feedback or just praise you know and and when you're young and and just starting out you know that's a huge deal and and you know just the way fanfic is set up it, it really welcomes a lot of people in who otherwise would probably never occur to them to to write for themselves and yeah, no, it, it's definitely been an entry point for some amazing writers. And so I, I definitely underline that recommendation. Thank you. I love how that ties back into earlier presentations today too. Um, all right, I, I wanna thank Alec, Chelsea and Marie so much for participating and reading. It was a true delight to be here with you today. Um, and up next, editor Trevor Cashry will announce the winners of our first annual Analog Award for Emerging Black Voices after he talks a bit about the award first. Trevor Cashry, before taking the reins of Analog Science Fiction and Fact as editor in 2012, started off as an editorial assistant in 1999 and worked his way up the ladder at Analog and Asimov Science Fiction under Stanley Schmidt, Sheila Williams, and Gardner Dezois, respectively. On top of that, he's also been a Broadway stagehand, collected data for museums, and executive produced a science fiction pilot for a basic cable channel. He lives in New Jersey with his fiance, daughter, and way, way too many comic books. Uh, hi there. Yeah, I'm Trevor Cashery. I'm the current editor of Analog Science Fiction Fact. And um, I, I wanted to take a brief moment to say thank you to Ida for bringing up an earlier question about uh, Clarion and workshops and things like that and the cost of conventions, because that is something that we had in the back of our heads when we were originally talking about the, um, the creation of this award and how we would go about approaching some of these uh, issues. So it, it's fitting that we're announcing the winner of the first annual Analog Award for Emerging Black Voices today at City Tech, uh, well, at, um, and that we're announcing during a symposium on access and science fiction because the impetus for the award really came from City Tech and matters of access are, going back to Ida's question, maybe the driving force behind the award. So we, we've seen today that there are myriad ways to think about this theme of access. And it was a few years ago, right before COVID, uh, having just attended that year's symposium that um, Emily and I noted that our offices at the time were just a single subway stop away from the Brooklyn City Tech campus. These two institutions had been practically neighbors for years, one hosting a science fiction symposium and offering science fiction classes, and the other a long running science fiction market, wondering how to best bring in new authors until a chance meeting brought us together. And that illustrated a disconnect. We were eager to offer our professional expertise, but we didn't know who needed it or how to present it efficiently. And there were people out there who may want to be a part of science fiction, but didn't necessarily know anyone already in the field to get a foot in the door. Selling to a magazine only works if you know the magazine exists. Trying to join the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America is only a goal if you're already tapped into science fiction somewhat. So what about the people who weren't? Who would benefit most from that knowledge? Who, due to systemic hurdles, is least likely to have had that helping hand or welcoming voice, encouraging them to try to make that first step? Uh, even in the age of the quick Google, you need to know where to start. Uh, the simplest things can seem insurmountable if you don't know that they're simple. And so this award was born from a desire to break down those barriers and to extend that hand as best we can. Um, so this is just the first step on a long road. In future years, we need to continue to spread the word, uh, to reach out to prospective authors outside of the usual channels, to reach out to, for example, professional associations for black scientists, to students who may know science fiction from TVs and movies, like many have said, but who haven't considered writing it and more. Yeah, you know, anything we can think of. Talk of rising tides in 2021 is all too likely to be literal, but we believe that rising tides lift all boats and we hope that by raising the authors that we can, it will, in the end, benefit everyone. So uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank the people who have made this award possible, who have themselves made the insurmountable seem simple to us, first-time uh, mentors and award givers. 
First and foremost, this year's judges and mentors, Nisi Shaw, Stephen Barnes, and Kim A. Kirtland, who have and will be contributing their valuable time and expertise as authors and as an agent to help make the path to professional publication a little less thorny. Uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers at City Tech, specifically Jason Ellis, Wynette Clyde, Jill Belly, Lucas Kwong, Ayla Vell Porter, uh, all of whom we've had a, a warm and mutually beneficial relationship with, uh, who have kindly allowed us to be a part of their event for several years. And we hope we've contributed as much as we've benefited. And we'd also like to thank Sarah Pinsker, who graciously helped us to build on some of what uh, the science fiction and fantasy writers of America have done in the area of mentoring and who steered us towards some rules for good mentorship. So with no further ado, and in no particular order, this year's runners up are Jermaine Martin of Grand Prairie, Texas, Yazid Dezele of Ajuba, Nigeria, and Erica Hardison of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Erica provided us with a statement I'd like to read. She says, I wanna express my gratitude to all of the editors and readers who've read my short story. Despite my story being incomplete, I'm honored that you're willing to invest time in me by offering me a mentoring session. I'm ecstatic to be a runner-up because it took a lot of courage, courage I wasn't sure I had to submit my story. I'm proud to be a Black emerging voice in sci-fi. I hope the stories I tell inspire others to find solutions to our everyday issues. Thank you, Analog Science Fiction and Fact Magazine, for the opportunity again, and I look forward to submitting again next year. Uh, and now we come to our winner, who is Kedrick Brown of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I also have a short statement from Kedrick. He says, thank you to the contest judges and analog editors for this amazing honor. I feel really privileged to be recognized for my work and to have the chance to work with the wonderful writers to make my story the best it can be. As I've told my son and daughter before, I truly believe that the world needs more stories. Just as different background walls can highlight very different things about the same painting, good stories can highlight profoundly different things about the human experience. So the more the merrier. I'm happy to bring a new story to the world's attention with Analog's help, and I eagerly look forward to reading the work of future award winners. Thank you all so much. So there you go. We look forward to working with Kedrick, Erica, Yadzid, and Jermaine in the new year and discussing the progress we've made and the next batch of mentees at next year's symposium. Uh, thank you all again. And Thank you all so much for you know, being a part of uh, the symposium now for, as you said, several years. Um, I think it, it's mutually beneficial. I think it's great for um, our students and also like you know, the fandom that's here in the city. And now with us being online, even though this is like a weird and uh, unfortunate situation about you know, having a Zoom webinar rather than an in-person event, uh, we're actually reaching so many more people this way and we're getting more people involved. So it was like, through this new impediment, we're actually increasing access in different ways. So, I mean, it's really cool and it's great to hear the things that you all are doing at Analog uh, with the Emerging Black Voices Award. And I, you know, I, I imagine all of us are eager to see their work eventually come out. So, you know, you know, thanks Trevor, Emily, uh, Alec, Chelsea, and Marie, uh, all for being here and being a part of the symposium. Because um, in many ways, it, it feels like family now and that, that's a cool feeling, so thank you. Um, so right now, uh, we're at four o'clock, uh, so I'm going to begin setting things up for our keynote uh, by Hamina Gallardo and Anne Matsuchi. I've been really looking forward to hearing them talk about uh, writing ourselves and teaching writing and science fiction with Wikipedia. Um, you're thinking through different ways of providing access both uh, for um, learning about science fiction, but also being participants in, in that, that reporting and criticism and making knowledge available more widely. So uh, thank you all again in Analog, and we'll get started again with uh, the keynote in just a few moments. <laughs> 